Hey, greetings everyone. It is Gleekon <clears throat> back again, bringing you another episode of Lore of Warcraft. Thank you for tuning in. You guys are amazing. Um, on our last episode, we continued to play through Duskwood, and we took, um, I think we took Erator, and he just bashed some skulls, literally some skeleton heads, and cracked open and found what was inside, and we got some more cool lore on Jitters and the continuing saga of the Scythe of Elune and what the Worgen has done to the little world that we're in. Crud, I just realized I didn't bring a drink and it is hot as heck back here, but I'm going to sweat it out steam shop style. <clears throat> I don't know what a steam shop is, but we're going to find out right now. We've also been reading through the World of Warcraft official magazine. We're on the final issue, although I don't know that the writers know that it's the final issue. We don't know what's happening behind the, the scenes, so we're going to kind of see if we can just see if we notice any cracks in the veneer. Um, so far, I haven't seen any, but we're just going to do our second part. Last time we did the feature, which was all about um, the Firelands uh, update or expand, not expansion, but the patch or whatever you want to call it. Um, and this time, if you want to stay a while and listen, we're going to do our feature interview and we'll see how long that takes. But it's called Frankly, He Gives a Damn. This is a pun on the guy's name, Frank Pierce. He's one of Blizzard's co-founders, and he knows how to get things done. Just don't ask him to answer the phone. As Blizzard Entertainment celebrates their 20th anniversary, few people can say they were there at the beginning of it all. Frank Pierce can. This is not 20th anniversary of WoW. This is straight Blizzard. So we sat down with the co-founder and executive vice president of product development to find out about the early days the evolution of Battle.net, if you remember that. If you're old like me, you can remember when they rolled that out. And importantly, who is Frank Pierce? Who is Frank Pierce? Well, you don't ask the man himself. You talk with the people who know him, who have worked with him. Shane DeBeery, lead producer, says, Frank's always been a no-nonsense, say-it-like-it-is leader at Blizzard. This is what people respect the most about Frank, though. For Some fear this as well. Frank cares deeply about Blizzard. This is him as a young man with some, some uh, skin pics on the wall. <clears throat> And it's people and ultimately wants to see us all succeed. So when he is very passionate about something, you can always see him wear his emotions on his sleeve. That's from, uh, yeah, that lead. Now, Chris Metzen, the senior VP of creative development, sees him as a compassionate leader. He's passionate about making sure people are treated fairly and not lost in, in the mix. He has always inspired me as a leader who plays fair and is always thinking about the people as much as the mission. Now, that's like from basically his equal. Samwise Didier, the senior art director, who we interviewed last time, says, Without Franklin Grandin Pierce, Blizzard would not be what it is today. In the beginning, Frank was one of the soldiers who did what it took to produce fun games. That was 20 years ago, and today Frank is more of a general, both guiding and inspiring the troops. I used to get my hands dirty, but I haven't written code since 2005, Frank admits, but there was some code in StarCraft II that I wrote that is still used, just utilities for long-term development of the game. <clears throat> Frank meets with the production directors of World of Warcraft and StarCraft II every day to lend support and make sure that the teams stay on target. I read a ton of email. Yeah, welcome to the club, buddy. Because I am responsible for the World of Warcraft and StarCraft II, I'm on the distribution lists for both, and we get so much stuff. Yeah, he probably, I'm sure he has me beat. I get a couple hundred a day that I've got to sift through, but I'm sure he has me beat. World of Warcraft takes the lion's share of my time, though when StarCraft was going out the door, I had to put World of Warcraft to the side. Frank mostly helps the teams prioritize tasks, but pretty much leaves the content creation to them. I'm an extra set of eyes to validate the quality. Should we be putting this content patch out the door or up the quality bar? These teams are talented. Sometimes they just need a little bit of guidance. Uh, there's more pictures of him. Him crashed. Him with a team with the Lost Vikings, that's an OG pick. Do we see Chris Metzen? Maybe that's Chris Metzen right there? I can't, I don't know. I don't know their faces well enough to really tell. That's him playing with a controller at an old IBM or something. And again, a couple of the old dudes. There's a pick of the team. Can't tell which one is Chris Metzen because they're all so young there. I don't, you can't even tell which one is him. And there's him, tongue out, again, double... Just dual boxing, old school IBMs. And again, more skin picks. That's like Who Framed Roger Rabbit or something. So the guy uh, is definitely used to decorating his office with things that would no longer fly. <laughs> My personality is not well suited to remodeling a house. Frank is a very empowering leader, says Shane. He believes that we hire the best people and trusts in these people to do what they feel is best. This takes a lot of courage on Frank's part to give such trust, but it also allows his people to try things and take risks 
where they may not otherwise. Frank says the development teams come up with the big ideas themselves, but they are so close to what they're doing, sometimes they can get myopic. I try to help them make sure they're looking at the long-term picture and advancing the experience. If we're gonna invest resources, I hate to see all that effort stagnate, Frank says. I like us to leverage tech to be flexible and create something the community can use to make something we never even thought about. Frank upholds a high standard of quality for everything Blizzard does, but I hate the nitty gritty details of getting there. He says, that's why we have guys like J. Allen Brack and Tom Chilton, J. is production designer, and Tom is game director for World of Warcraft. Frank's commitment to quality doesn't end at Blizzard's games, it's just the type of guy he is. While this dedication has paid off for the gaming community sometimes, as evidenced by his recent remodeling of his home, Frank's personality costs him. All I wanted to do was replace the kitchen cabinets and windows, Frank says. We stripped it down to the studs. We ended up making changes to the frame and to the floor plan just because I wanted new windows. I mean, that also is a byproduct of having, being flush with, flush with cash. Along the way, Frank also re-leveled the entire house. The moral of the story is that my personality is not well suited to remodeling a house. I enjoyed the end result. It was a very expensive process. I have expensive tastes because I want it done right. All right. Okay, so now we're saying, I have expensive tastes. I like skin flicks, pictures on the wall. Mm. Guy's coming off as a little bit of a skis. I don't know. Unless he's still the boss of Blizzard, then hey, please give me a job. Though a job as a remodeler may not be in his future, you have to admire the drive that Frank brings to all his endeavors. Without it, one of Frank's greatest projects, the new version of Battle.net, rolled out for StarCraft II, may never have existed. The Battle.net Map Editor Marketplace. StarCraft II might have been in people's hands sooner, but the team wasn't quite happy with how players interacted with the original Battle.net, which has long been used to match up StarCraft and Warcraft players for competitive games. Yeah, I mean, I can remember using it back in the day, war, war, like uh, Warcraft II. Early in the development of StarCraft II, Battle.net was being treated like it was for Warcraft III, namely another button on the menu when you ran the game. I had this vision in my head Rob Pardo came up with the phrase, we need to create this always connected experience. Now when you launch StarCraft II and enter your Battle.net credentials, you're instantly connected to your real ID, achievements, and character profiles. That decision came late in the dev process and it delayed the game. It cost us time and resources, but it was the right thing to do, Frank says. They're making some changes to Battle.net right now as an app, I'm wondering, because there used to be an authenticator app that you would get. Um, and now they said that that's going to be defunct and it all rolls through Battle.net, so I, I wonder what's going to go on with that. While Frank is happy about the change of direction for Battle.net, he's not yet fully satisfied with where it is. There's more to do. I wish we had shipped with the Marketplace, which is envisioned as a way for modders and map designers to share their creations with the rest of the community like an app store. I mean, you could kind of do that on Warcraft 2, sort of. I'm still really passionate about that, Frank says. I make that clear to the dev team every week. It's no secret to them. The force behind that creation is the Map Editor, a tool included with StarCraft 2 that allows players to make custom maps and beyond even entire games. Blizzard itself recently released several new free games built with the editor, including Star Jeweled, a combination of StarCraft and Jeweled, and Iron Chef, which, where Protoss zealots meet Iron Chef. The StarCraft II map editor owes much to the success of the map editor from Warcraft 3. It's a really powerful tool, Frank says. You could look at Warcraft 3 as more than just a game, it's a platform. It spawned a genre in Defense of the Ancients, that's absolutely right, in, in what do they call it, MOBA, or like that type of thing in tower defense maps. When we created the map editor, we had no idea that that was going to happen. That's amazing. We recognized uh, a, a lot more when we were working on StarCraft II. I mean, I've, I've only played that game a little bit, but I gotta say, as much as I don't like PvP, the toxicity of that has always dro drove me away, the, the steep learning curve. Frank Pierce hears him again, goofing it up. C customer service rep. If you called Silicon and Synapse in those early days, the chances were good that Frank would be the person on the other end of the line. When it was just me, Mike, and Alan, I had to answer the Elfin phones. <laughs> oh, the Effin phones. Uh, Elfin might be funnier. If applicants were calling, I took those calls, and I was as pleasant on the phone then as I am now, Frank says. I don't know if I believe, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. For that shirt, I kind of like it. The salty greetings weren't meant personally, but were more a reaction to being interrupted while doing something thought intensive. When you're writing code, you're in the groove. Today, you're always distracted. Everyone can do task switching. 20 years ago, I hated task switching. So if the phone rang, I'd cuss. Although Frank spent some time answering the phones in the early days, not many on-screen calls get through to him today, but some still do. It doesn't even seem like an, a real true interview got through to him. So that is maybe a crack that we're seeing that they they can't even get in-house interviews for the magazine. I don't know if I like to watch them. 
Soon after, Blizzard had introduced a billing method that integrated with your phone. A concerned mother got Frank on the phone asking to have her son's subscription deactivated and taken off her phone. I'm not the guy you want to talk to, Frank told her. I'll put you in contact with the right people. The issue, as far as Frank knew, was resolved. Two months later, the phone rings and it's her again. I want to reactivate my son's account, she says. Really? She has a different impression of the inner workings of Blizzard than the rest of us, Frank says, theorizing that the color thinks the whole company is in the same room and all Frank has to do is yell at somebody in the next cubicle. I'm not trained to talk with people like that. That's him sitting down. I don't know if this is him just for a photo op, if he really has got a lot of uh, liquor in his uh, room as well. This is definitely old school office style. Things that wouldn't fly in current world, I don't think. When Warcraft 3 was the hot thing, custom maps were only available via other sites on the internet. Frank wants the experience to be more cohesive. The players should be getting those maps directly from the client, integrated in the client. That's how it works now. We could enhance that experience even further. We all see ways we can take it, for, take it further, Frank says. We have really, really passionate players. It's great to have people passionate about our games, but we don't have the resources to provide them all the content they want to experience. Look at Cataclysm. It took us 24, 25 months to make an immense amount of work. We revamped the whole world. Players voraciously consume that content in days, some in weeks, some in months. How do you deal with that? Two years to create the biggest experience in World of Warcraft, and they went through it just like that. Frank says that giving the community the tools to serve itself with compelling content is very powerful, so definitely we want to take it further, Frank says. When I think of StarCraft II's marketplace, I don't think of just interactive maps. The map editor was used to do in-game narrative. Why couldn't some use it for non-interactive storytelling? I imagine a day where people download non-interactive movies, making it not a game, but an entertainment platform. The thinking isn't limited to the map editor. What if you could edit a replay of a StarCraft II game, add your commentary, and this is dreaming, to the replay, maybe add Telestrator-like graphics and put it on the marketplace for people to view, do it for a campaign mission, and now it's a visual strategy guide. Um, I 100% think you can do that nowadays. Before Blizzard, Frank studied computer science at UCLA. I studied it because it was practical, Frank says. I wasn't good at English or history or whatever that crap was. I was good at math, but once I took a few calculus courses, I realized I wasn't really good at math either. Um, that's my background for those of you guys out there. I was, I took math as far as I could go in college. Um, I, I was working on a master's at math, but I, I aced everything up into differential equations, pa you know, past calc three for any of you. Um, number theory, li uh, linear algebra, that was my collegiate background. Once Frank graduated from UCLA, he handed a job in aerospace at Rockwell International in Seal Beach, California. There were a couple of sticking points with this, however. Frank was hired in July, but the industry doesn't assign anyone to a project until the beginning of the calendar year. So until January, Frank was on loan to the Downey location. It was work, but it didn't sing to him. I could have done it, but I don't think I would have been happy. There were guys that had been at Rockwell for 15 years, and they were doing the same thing that people that had been there for a year or six months were doing. Toward the end of the year, for reasons still unknown to Frank himself, he was put in a call to Alan Adam, a buddy he had met at US UCLA. When I was 21 or 22, I was horrible at maintaining relationships and keeping contact. He had to call or send snail mail. It's a lot easier now, but I'm still bad at it today. I just happened to give him a call. I don't remember why. Alan told Frank that, being, that he'd been about to get in touch with him about a project he planned, a company that would be making video games. If Frank had a dream job, this might have been it. I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. If I could make games, that'd be awesome. I didn't even think of how to pursue it, much less do it. But Alan had a plan and contacts with Interplay. Frank was a bit worried about, his, what, what, about what his father might say about him trying his hand at the video game market, but it turned out that he was all for it. He was very encouraging. He didn't think it was that much of a risk. The gist of it was that Frank was young and had a few responsibilities. So if the game thing didn't work out, we could just go get another job. And that's what our big quote in the middle is. Here's another circumstance. Here, another circumstance worked in Frank's favor. The aerospace industry in Southern California was taking a nosedive and companies were dropping jobs like spent booster rockets. I will go back to that. Basically went to my boss and requested a layoff, Frank says. So while he was helping to get Silicon and Snap started, Frank was getting paid severance from Rockwell. Nice. All right, so what do we have here? We have competitive, this is like an internal article. I don't know what it's all about, but this looks like him. He's wearing a Horde shirt. Maybe he's a runner. Yeah, these are uh, marathons. Executive Frank Pierce. He's got his nameplate. He Camp Pendleton race. He's done that twice, it looks like. And yeah, so 10K mud run. 
If you want to find Frank on the weekends, you'd better put on your running shoes. He's probably participating in a foot race. One of his favorites is the annual Mud Run Series held at California's Camp Pendleton. It's a tough 10K cross country. There are obstacles. They spray you down. Your shoes get heavier and heavier. Everyone is happy just that they've finished. To help people reach the goal, Frank likes to shout encouragement near the finish line. There's beer and you get to shower with chicks at the end of the race. It's totally true. Thanks. Frank enjoys the race so much that not only has he put together a blizzard team, last year they finished it first in their category and the, the medal adorns a thrall statue, statue in Frank's office, but he's running the 10K multiple times this year. I'm running it four times across three weeks. It's going to be brutal. It beats me up pretty good, but it's worth it. I got to look and see if this guy, um, if he's still employed. <laughs> he just seems like uh, an... an not something that would survive in the modern climate. For me, running is like the World of Warcraft experience. There are these players on the high end, and there are people who aspire to it but can never reach it. I aspire to be that guy who ran the LA Marathon in 206, but I'll never reach it. I'm just striving to improve. That's kind of how I see myself as a, a Warcraft player. But don't make the mistake that Frank is in it just for the experience. He's super competitive in all that he does. Shane DeBeery, lead producer, says, We once had a contest to see who could lose the most weight, and he, of course, won. The rest of us... As punishment, had to give up something we cherished for a month. I had to give up playing video games. Frank also has the Ragnar Relay, a 200-mile relay on his schedule. It's supposed to be fun, but it sounds kind of brutal. Here's another picture. Maybe he's in here, right here, going rogue. When you're one of the big shots at a global company, it can be tough to find the time to play games. Frank finds time to play his rogue, running dailies in Toll Broad, emphasis on the running. My rogue is so horrible right now, he says, I'm really good at running away. I play a rogue. I'm an executive producer, so you know we're not giving any favoritism to that class, Frank jokes. But there must be someone in the class design team that's playing a pally. That's true. Frank's dedication to the rogue class is evident in his office, where a painting by Alex Horley hangs in a prominent spot. In the center of the piece, amidst a few other familiar faces, can you name them? Answers below. We'll look at that in a sec. Stands Frank brandishing dual daggers. That's him in the middle. Okay, so John Legrave. That's him. The warlock. Uh, World of Warcraft senior game producer. I don't even know what he is. He's got like this dark, maybe that's supposed to be a warlock because he's got a demon right there. Um, L. Allen Brack. That's this guy in the back. The Maybe that's a priest. Frank Pierce right there. Carlos Guerrero, World of Warcraft senior game producer as well. Uh, yeah, they don't even say who that guy is, so who knows. Vintage Frank, here's him with all his wine. One of Frank's passions is wine, an interest he picked up on a trip to Temecula, California. We went out to the Pechanga Resort in Temecula on a wine tasting bus, Frank says. It was a good social experience. I was more hooked on the social experience than the wine. My passion for wine is very high, but it's very hard for me to compare my level of passion to other people's, Frank says. A friend of his recently went through extensive training to become a sommelier, and the level of knowledge needed blew Frank away. As far as wine passion goes, that guy to me is the same as the 206 marathon runner to me as the Fires of Heaven guild is to a typical player. But still his enthusiasm is high, as displayed by the wine cellar he set up in his home recently. Until it was finished, much of Frank's collection was taking up a lot of space in his office on the Blizzard campus. The most valuable thing about wine is sharing it with your buddies, your friends, and your family. I like wine. Okay, so this is Frank Pierce. I'm just going to kind of slowly Google it as we go. Uh, the early days of Blizzard. Try to imagine what a startup start video game company would look like from the very beginning. Basically, all you've got is an idea, an address, and an empty office. Alan had ordered melamine desks, I'm guessing that's like almost like for Micah, from some office supply chain. We were assembling desks the first day, Frank says. One of the first projects the company did was to port a game to the Commodore Amiga, so the team had to figure out how to code on that platform. We'd never written a line of code on Commodore Amigas in our lives, Frank says. People don't appreciate the internet. You're really living in an information age. This wasn't the case in the early 90s. Back then, how do you learn about coding for the Amiga? We had to go down to some weird, obscure computer store and look for Amiga books. We had to read the books and try to figure it out on our own through trial and error. There's no open source. There's no Wikipedia. We had to figure this out on our own, and it was fun. Looking back, I guarantee there was a lot of cussing. It's challenges that people don't have to face today. It builds character. It puts hair on your chest. Okay, so he's got not a lot of followers, 7,000 followers. Um, he is the former senior VP, so he's no longer in that capacity. 
Um, then and now, things are a lot different now. I joke with Mike, our very first office was maybe 650 square feet, broken into three offices. Mike had that space in it, has that space in his office today. The offices are bigger, but they are needed. The development teams are bigger. The community is bigger. The pressures are bigger. The biggest difference is that you can see a transition from where 20 years ago we were jacks of all trades. Roles are more defined now. If I needed a piece of art and no one was around to do it for me, I'd have to create it myself. I was writing the code. I was taking the narrative script and adding it in. Now we've reached a point in specialization. 15 years ago, we just had artists. Today we have character artists. Then they hand it over to an animation team. And another team does environmental detail and environmental backgrounds. That's just the art teams. Although a company like Blizzard employs thousands of people and divides work into very specialized roles, that's not the only way to make games. The industry's come full circle, Frank says. There are opportunities that exist where you can create a great experience with a very small group of people who do that jack-of-all-trades stuff. It's even better now. You don't need to find a publisher. While Frank may joke about how things have changed for him, it's a bittersweet punchline. I miss the camaraderie and intimate relationships. We had no one to rely on but ourselves, and I miss the level of teamwork. I don't miss all-nighters, I'll tell you that. There were times we did them down to the wire to get a product out the door, and you might be here 30 hours straight. I don't even know if I'd be physically capable of doing that today. He's done the long haul before. For six months leading to the gold master of Warcraft 3, Frank was at the office working every day except one, April 14th. Even that day, I came in here to get my tax documents. That's right. He worked every day for six months, but took one day off to do his taxes. All the work pays off, though. I'm so It's so satisfying to finish it, go to GM, Goldmaster, ship it, and have players buy it. That's really awesome. It feels that things you do today are relevant because so many people will see it. We're really blessed that we make entertainment products that are enjoyed by millions. That is super cool. Yeah, so in 2019, he uh, left the company. He was also listed as a, an, an influence on the South Park episode. Um, but now this is coming from Wowpedia. So it's certainly... Uh, like um, not necessarily unbiased doesn't really say I'm trying to find a little bit more about him it just says he's going to pass the torch to the next generation um, Now, the other people they've mentioned here, Alan Adam and Mike Morhaime, um, had already left a while before that. So he was the last of the original three co-founders. So none of the original founders of Blizzard are still there. Um, doesn't really say a lot, just said that he bounced. Um, yeah, I wonder why... He just says to pass the touch torch to a new generation. So, huh. For the Horde, one of Frank's favorite things at his home is this Horde symbol done in Italian travertine. It's awesome. It matches the qualities of the game, Frank says. Oh, this symbol right there. He's quick to point out in the interest of faction equality that Mike Morham has an alliance medallion on display at his home. So, I see. Oh, that's what he's talking about, the tile. So, he's got the Horde symbol. All right, so there is a article. Let's see. Yeah, it's another kind of longer feature. I don't, just because I am sweating bullets back here under the hot lights. Um, my son was in here playing video games for hours, and I was already kind of hot. Um, I'm not going to pull out another one. We'll just... Yeah, all it says is... Uh, there's just not a lot of there's not a lot even if you look at reddit from back then they just say like he's retiring so yeah there's not anything so there's no scandals um, and he might have just really did, you know, he was with the company 28 years. So it might have just been a straight retire. So I don't need to fish for a scandal where there isn't one. Um, and uh, yeah, you're getting older. And obviously he's just from another generation. So we might have survived without a scandal. He just might have been a little rough around the edges for by today's standards. And yeah, pass that torch, buddy. But obviously founding the coolest company, um, 
at least in terms of the games that they put out. I got to give my hats off to him. Much respect. And um, yeah, so that's it. We got another episode in the pipe, 5x5. Five five. I might not be reaching millions yet, but uh, I totally just get the biggest thrill out of the, those of you that uh, watch and like and subscribe and all that stuff. Um, you guys are awesome, and I, and I get it. I, I get what he says on a much smaller scale. It's pretty cool that uh, we can do something together. Um, and uh, I look forward to seeing you guys next time on the next episode of Lore of Warcraft. See ya, everybody.